There's nothing wrong with saying, you know, you don't know, or it's not your expertise or whatever it may be. There's always the opportunity to say, I, you know, I can't speak to that. I apologize. What I can speak to is blah, 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 what you're really, really good at. And you can always just swing it back in. When I think back, I spent so much time trying to be the person that I think that I thought I should have been rather than just be me. From Toronto, Phantom Media presents the Not So Corporate Podcast. Hello, hello, hello. I'm Mark Drager, the host of the Not So Corporate Podcast. I'm joined here in studio with Leah Earl. Hey, Leah. Hello. And this not is. Not Roland. F- not Roland. No, he's too busy. Uh, apparently. We work uh, at a bustling workplace that is. <laughs> we had him. So you sent out a calendar request, which. I which, did. Which he said he would he would come to or what? no he never ever ever not even once has responded to any of my <laughs> calendar requests so so just so you guys know roland thinks he's too good for all y'all he doesn't want to does. uh yeah but anyway so anyway it's me and leah we're here hello how you doing and on uh this week's episode i am so excited we have a very special episode we do we have special guest matt garner and matt is um is a producer and uh, I'm not sure if he's a cinematographer or what aspect he is, but he's a producer who, who runs uh, a video production firm. Uh, he's an entrepreneur. Called, he's an entrepreneur, Mint Studios uh, down in Texas. And we know Matt because he's a listener. He uh, found us through YouTube, and he's been listening to the podcast, and he's been emailing me back and forth, and we've watched him go through a rebrand, and he's asked me a few questions, and he asked me a great question via email, and normally I would set up a conference call. I'd set up like a call to try and I, – I can't answer a complicated question in email. No. Because usually a question just posed to me just makes me ask qualifying questions. I always want to try and make sure that my answer is actually detailed to the specific question. So he asked me this really great question um, about proposals and sales and these other things for startups. And I, I was going to schedule a call with him. And I said, you know what, Leah, rather than schedule a call with him, let's have him on the podcast. And so I, I asked Matt if he'd be willing to come on and, and share his question as well as work through the stuff back and forth. So I'm not sure if he's the host or if I'm the host or I, I have no idea what's about to happen, but we are going to have him on the podcast and he is going to be able to uh, ask me the question related to sales and proposals and starting a business and all those things. And so if you find yourself in a position where you're struggling with those things, then I say stay tuned because we're about to rock your socks off. As I mentioned in the opening, Leah, we're joined with Matt Garner from Mint Studios. Uh, Matt, we wanted to have you on and have you talk about your thoughts. You ask us questions, we ask you questions, and we'll do a bit of a dance. So uh, welcome, Matt. Thank you very much. I appreciate your courage because this is an interesting way to approach the solution. But, you know, you guys are all in, and uh, I appreciate everything that y'all have done for um that y'all offer on that. On we're this kind we're of all stuff. in, and you're and you're from you're from the Southern Americas, right? I am the Southern Americas, which is also a separate country called Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so, so hit us hit us with the question. You know, we're a startup, and we started back in official label started back earlier, beginning of this last year in 2015, and then um, I had sort of been building the business plan a few months prior to that. And of course, you know, sales is sales, and doesn't matter what business you're in. As a business owner, I wake up thinking about how do I sell? And um, I think um, my actual question to you initially, after you've researched and essentially sold a new prospect verbally, what are you presenting to them in the way of proposal? And uh, I can quickly preface that by saying many of the people that I've talked to and researched hold that set of cards very close to their chest. Um, it's that internal communication that, you know, that private information they propose to the client. So I was really impressed that you you know wanted to kind of talk about that and go ahead tell me what what do you guys do because that's been definitely something that we've uh, struggled with and are now just now beginning to kind of emerge out of out of darkness okay so you know that's a great question because depending on how you're handling the sale whether it's a bit more cut and dry and you're coming at it more you know these are the technical components and here's what each component costs and and voila that you know it's more of a quote you're more of a sales desk or if you're coming at it more from a you know consultant background where you know, they, the client has a need and you're the solution to that need and you're the service provider and you want to help walk them through it as a series of steps. That's really, I think, what's key. And so 
you know, Matt, I'd be interested in, in what in what you're doing right now and what you've yeah. tried, you know, whether you are in your market. And, and that's the other thing. I think your market plays a huge part in it because everything about sales, in my mind, is just walking the client through whatever they need to be comfortable to move forward. You have, you know, you have to do, let's say, 10 steps. And, and I just had a, a, a conversation with someone earlier this morning um, where where they're you know an, a new prospect. I've never worked with them with this company before, but I worked with someone in the company and I got referred in. And they have a pretty cut and dry need. And so we had one meeting. Normally we'd have two or three. And I still need to do the steps. I still need to walk through the the ten steps. Let's say that onboard someone from initial conversation to ready to go into production. You know, but but. I, I said to them, I said, do you need a full proposal? If you need a full proposal, we still have to have two more meetings. But if all you really need is a statement of work, all you really need is a, is a yes, let's get a contract signed, and then we can do the work after the fact, that's fine too. Ultimately, we need to go through the, the, the 10 steps, let's say, as an example. But if you're ready to sign today, we can do the 10 steps after you've signed. If you need more time with us to be comfortable we're moving ahead with us, then we'll work through three or four of those steps now and then sign, or work through seven steps and then sign. And ultimately, um, you know, I think the approach and and whether it's the proposal or a statement of work or a quote or even just an email or even just a handshake or a full presentation where you're coming in with PowerPoint and multiple people and presenting the concept to them, I think it depends on what the client needs in order to feel comfortable and move forward. And I think that's the that's that's like the highest level way that I look at it. It's it's not a cut and dry thing. It's not a linear thing. It's it's hey customer. Tell me, tell me what you need to be comfortable to move forward with us. Well, and I thought something that was really interesting. I heard I was on this uh, the YouTube channel, I guess earlier last year, the year before, and you were talking uh, on a Google interview, and you had mentioned, you know, that your pro- progression of thought and how you, you know, wanted to grow your business. You could really tell that it was um, you really wanted to have a large business. You wanted to have a successful business. And it wasn't a passion play for you. And that's the thing that I think, you know, maybe when some of these startups, when they get going and they start to move in the direction of trying to figure out what kind of business they want to have, that they don't stay small minded and they don't stay in the, you seem like your focus was always that you wanted to grow the business. So what is your client base now versus when you started and how have you handled that differently as you've grown? Do you just try to go big in corporate now people come to you? Or how often are you going out in the cold call? So yeah, when I started the business, I mean, really, I was I was a nobody, right? I mean, I didn't have a portfolio. You were young. I was young. young. I was young. I was twenty four, and I didn't have a lot of experience. But I knew I knew what to do. I knew that what I did I did really well, and that was mostly related to internal communications. So you know, if you had this huge bank or this big. Um, engineering firm, or if you had this huge company and they had they had fifteen thousand or twenty thousand employees, they have budget, they have staff, they have a need, but you know, like the work was too small for um, for the agency of records, and that was the place I really got my footing was on internal communications because they'd have a little bit of budget to do something, but not enough to go to other people who knew who were big and knew what they were doing and established, and really over the last uh, nine or ten years, it's just been moving. It hasn't necessarily been moving. Uh, companies, because one of our longest term companies still works with us all these years later. I brought them on, I think, four months after I started the business through a friend, and they still work with us. But the type of projects we're doing with them and the people we're working with within, within the organization has has moved up. And that's mostly as we move from internal to kind of internal external, and then from external communications to marketing, and then from marketing to promotion, and from promotion to advertising. And as you kind of make that progression, the budgets get bigger, the the requirements get larger, the people you're working with goes up market. And we've done that with a few organizations. I, I would say probably eight to ten companies that that we we've grown with, and and they've grown with us, and we've kind of grown together. We came in on this weird kind of internal angle, and then gone from you know internal to um, to maybe training, and then from training to uh, maybe like a marketing promotion piece, and then from that to helping them with actual campaign type work. Um, I, I don't know. If, I mean, it, it still works for us today. <laughs> like we still onboard people that way. But how often are you dealing with a business owner or maybe the head of marketing? Uh, because let me preface that by saying a lot of the small business owners, you know, that we've dealt with, you know, they do everything, and they got like one guy 
or one girl who's doing Facebook, Twitter, they're trying to handle it all, but they're never going to get past that point. And so we try to come in and educate, you know, the value and bring value to that. But how often are you dealing with the business owner um, versus when you come in and there's just an immediate need and you did, you can just sort of push your plan and your value based on you know your work and experience? Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a fair question, but you got to be really careful with, I think, the thinking that got you to ask that question because um, what we do doesn't really matter to what you're doing um, only because the markets are different, the clients are different, the budgets are different. You know, we, we, we're located in Toronto and Toronto – is the is the largest city in Canada um, between Toronto and Montreal? You know, English Canada, French Canada. All of the corporate decisions are made. Um, they still pale in comparison to corporate America, where you guys are ten times larger than us in terms of mass and way larger in terms of budgets. But but we happen to be in a city that's not only a film based city. There's not only you know production here and film here. Corporate marketing decisions are made here, and so you know when we when we've we've done work in the U.S. Uh, and we hire local companies. We've done huge projects in Miami and Orlando and um, in Minnesota and in Vegas and some places in New York. Some places you have amazing producers with amazing stuff, and other places we go and we're like, "There's no one here. There's no business. There's no needs. There's no." So I, I can't speak directly for for where you are in Texas, but just to all listeners. Just, just be careful with your thinking because, because what we're doing works for us now. It works for us today where we're at with the market we're at. But, you know, I have a mentor who runs, uh, you know, a pretty large independent agency. Um, and where he's at, thir- you know, 25 years into his business, 30 years into his business, and with his company size of, you know, 30 employees and this, the budgets they're working with, I go, oh, man, I want that today. But it took him like a long time to get there. So, so I'll answer your question still, Matt. But just give yourself time. You know, if you're if you're a year in your business, or three years, or five years, or even today, I got to remind myself: give yourself time. It takes time to move up market. One project turns into two, two turns into six. You know, six turns into eighteen. So your 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 client base will grow. You'll grow. The budgets will grow. We're looking at launching a few new things here in the business too, and. I'm I'm approaching it early on. I was approaching it like, hey, I got you know ten years experience. We got a name. We got credibility. But if we step into something completely new, no one knows who we are. We have no experience per se. And who says we can charge the same pricing we're charging for video or or, or what have you? Because it's a new service. I think we can. I have confidence in our ability, and I know what we can deliver. But just give yourself time, man. Give yourself permission. It, that, well, that'd be that'd be what I say to you. But. To answer your question, I don't remember what it was now. <laughs> well, I mean, it's how you were you were talking about how what you're what you're having to deal with versus what we're having to deal with, and that is completely right. Fair. Marketing, I, marketing versus business owner, right? Yes, that yeah. was the question. Well, and then you know, um, like a, another question that I would I would want to pose to you is is early on, and then right now, or maybe even midway, maybe you can kind of target connect the dots when it came to doing video and yet you see maybe the business owners that you're dealing with or the companies that you're dealing with, they not only needed video, but they needed an audience. They had no social media. They needed all these other things that went with it. And how often was the temptation there and how often did you get sucked into doing these other things and trying to make all that happen when you really just should have stuck to your wheelhouse? That is the question, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's distribution. It's, like, well, it's more than that, and that's and that's the question I battled. Because you're a problem solver, like I am. You know, that's that's the way I look at it. I'm always trying to solve the problem, right? And you can get so stuck into diversifying your thinking when you should just stay on point. And sometimes you got to say no. But how did you deal with it? Did you was it? Well, it's, you know what? It's 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 interesting. So I mentioned my mentor. I had a conversation with him two or three months ago where I was. Um, <laughs> let's say bitching about our industry and the uh-huh. challenges and the clients. And I'm just like, Oh man, you know, this is what I want to do. And why won't people, why won't clients let us, you know, like we want to help them so much. Why won't they let us help them? And you know, he said something to me and he said, uh, you know, Mark, you're not, you're not an agency. You're, you're a video production company right now, right? You're a production company. You're not an agency. So, and, and there was something to what he was saying because he's just like, if you're an agency, then you take on all the responsibilities of all of the outcomes and all of the success and everything. You get the you get the you get paid to take on that responsibility, but you you get all the responsibility, and then and then you deliver to those needs. But 
ultimately you're held responsible at the end of the day. When you're a production company, you're responsible for producing content. And yeah, you, your content can contribute to a possible a positive outcome or a negative outcome, but you don't really have any control over it because all you're doing is is producing the content and then giving it back to the client or maybe helping them with small distribution strategy. But you're not an agency. You don't have all of the tools at your disposal to see the positive outcome of the entire campaign. And so... That got me thinking about whether we should be having all of those tools at our disposal and whether we should just be focused more on production of content or other things. But I'll pose the same thing to you. If you're a production company and you're responsible for producing content, that content can lead to a positive outcome, but it's not the only thing. An entire distribution strategy will lead to that positive outcome. If the client is paying you for the outcome, then they should be paying you for all activities contributing to that outcome. So how do you not get sucked into it? Well, maybe the answer is with your clients, you actually need to get sucked into it, but you need to be charging appropriately so you're not the one solely doing it. Maybe you're outsourcing that to a third-party company like an internet marketing firm or a web company that, that will do that for you. Or And, and if they don't see a value prop, if the, if the client goes, I'm not going to – what? It's going to cost me $2,000 a month to manage this social media campaign or whatever it is. I'm not paying $24,000 a year to do this on a $7,000 video. That makes no sense. Well, then there's no value prop for the entire thing. I mean, he's got to do the work or she's got to do the work. Their staff has to do the work or someone has to be paid to do the work. But there's no way to, to right size you know, you doing a project, even if it's 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 grand. There's no way that you're going to give them fifteen or thirty or fifty thousand dollars worth of social media or distribution or paid advertising services for free. There's someone's got to pay for it. That would be my answer. It's if the clients are asking you for it, if it's part of the value that you bring, then I would say maybe you got to embrace that. Maybe that's maybe that's the work that you got to take on the chin. Maybe that's the lost leader you need to do, and you need to just manage cost recovery for it in order to get the work you want. Maybe you're gonna. Maybe people are buying the social media distribution from you, but that's just giving you an excuse to do the video work that you really want to do and have the impact you want to have and build credibility with the client and then over time shift the conversation away from just distribution and focus more on, on content production. Well, and then the, the, the video has always been, the video aspect to me is always the culmination. And if it's not a training video, but it's a, it's a culmination of the brand. And, you know, all those different questions that we've had to struggle with over the last several months is, well, we got to get the brand right. we got to answer the why question. we got to create the brand experience. But all these other things over here are void. Or they don't exist in this client's wheelhouse. They don't. And that was the thing I think that we struggled with the most. And there was a bit of a dance when you've got these smaller budgets and yet you've got people who are doing millions of dollars of business every year. How do we turn the head of that monster to where they'll actually see the value? And let's begin with you know brand and vision, and then allow allow some of those other things to be taken on um, by those third parties. And we've had to do that. We've well, had to take well, on third parties. I've well, got Matt, let me ask you. Let me ask you. What are you that. what are you selling? Is your firm selling the video, the content production, creativity? The positive outcome, you know, distribution strategy, um, ROI, case, like, like, what, what do you sell? We sell value. And I think that's one of the things that we definitely want our clients to see is immediately, you know, we've got a couple things that, you know, I like to address right up front is have we heard them and are we, are we able to bring value to the customer? And then it's up to us to figure out the best way to do that. And at that point, it has not seemed like there's any formula. There's just the way that we're going to do it and if it's been effective. Value. It's a very abstract thing, right? Right. It is It is abstract because we're bringing value not just from ourselves to show them that we have value in the marketplace and that we've got competency and, and, and good collateral, but that we're also going to bring value to whatever their brand is. And this is the way that you do that. And then we show them, you know, not only industry-wide information, but how we've been able to do that for people in the past. Hmm. It's, yeah, no. I, I think what, like either, either you do the work, like you, you do define it more clear for the client on a one-off basis that's customized just for them. And you're just hesitant to share it with me right now because we're speaking in the general. Or you just leave it there, in which case it's a pretty abstract concept. And... I don't know. As I'm listening to it, I'm just not sure if it's uh, 
if it's tight enough. Well, let me ask you, what's the same question? Yeah, what do you sell? Uh, we sell a solution to a client's challenge. So um, if a client has a business challenge, that could be um, employee retention, recruitment, uh, employee engagement. It could be lead generation. It could be a sales challenge. Um, it could be uh, increasing spend. It could be go-to-market strategy for product. It could be any business challenge that exists. This is our current positioning. Any business challenge that exists, we leverage content to help them overcome that challenge. That's what we sell. I mean, there's other things. We sell we sell strategy, and and we execute against that strategy, and we have services that we offer, and and you know I think we do a pretty gar- darn good job with the team on doing that, and we're fast, and we're uh, a hungry company, and we're we're actually fairly competitively priced compared to really big agencies and things like that. Like all of those things are in the background, but the end of the day, what are we selling? Um, for one comp- for one client, it might be confidence. For another one, it might be experience. Well, maybe if we back this thing up, and the question would be kind of based on that initial email that I sent you, is when you've had clients or prospects that have come to the point of making the deal, and you're at the point where there's a, a give and take of not only we've had our 10 minutes with the client, and everybody's been able to talk through it, uh, and sometimes it may take more than one of those to get to the point, and depending on the urgency of the client, but where have you seen and have you seen a pattern when it comes to insecurity at the close of a deal that you kind of come in and you figured out what is maybe one or two three things that have worked to alleviate some of that insecurity to get us you know to get whether it's a number issue or a uh, sure sure yeah um, so there's a few things in my past because um, I've worked for I worked for a large franchise organization I've been as I've produced content for for old companies I used to work at who helped train people in different ways by producing the content by by the very nature of filming it and editing and what I, I kind of got put through the training myself so I've had a lot of experience actually of capturing specific sales trainings and so there's a few things that that we kind of subconsciously leverage in our organization which which may be new to you or you may you may already know but um, every every client close is different because every client uh, requires um, a different set of circumstances to meet it. It might just be money. It might be money and time. It might be comfort level, experience, whatever it may be. And so if you have a prescribed approach where you go meeting one, meeting two, meeting three, proposal, delivery, and it doesn't have any room for flexibility, you're going to you're gonna have to assume or get very good at catching people when they're actually emotionally ready to buy. Some people are A-type personalities and they're ready to buy within a 20-minute conversation. Other people need a lot of details and they need to know everything written down and everything all... T's crossed, all I's dotted. They need everything. And then, you know, you might have to spend six months with them just getting it closed. And so one key thing to, to keep aware of is there's this idea in sales training of a trial close or, or soft closing where, you know, throughout your process in your head, you always have the next step that you can continue moving them forward with. Now, it's a bit risky because you're committing more and more and more time without commitments on their ends, but you're always trial closing. And so, by the time we arrive at the proposal, uh, in a in a longer sales process, the only reason we're not getting the work is if something large happens, a project, uh, a budget gets cut. Um, uh, what would be another reason? A budget gets cut. They 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 you know our client gets f- our contact gets fired. Um, they get purchased by another organization. Everything gets put on hold. Um, they decide that they're going to hold off on waiting for a rebrand, which takes a year. Um, you know, it's just it's just a big thing because our proposal is actually just um, a collection of everything that we've discussed with them in every meeting. There's nothing new there. There's no new information. Everything has already been discussed. So there's no sticker shock on pricing because we've already had a few conversations around what pricing is and what it costs and what they have to work with and how are we going to do this. There's no shock on resources they require because we've already explored that or, you know, the the pitch if we're if it's a if it's a creative type project and we're presenting different creative approaches to them, we've already presented the approach. They've already selected the approach. We do all this stuff in pre-sale, which is which is time intensive and costly. But it means that when we get to the proposal, it's 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 a formality. That's why we have different versions of of, of proposals. We have longer ones. We have shorter ones. Um, I don't like to. As much as our proposals may be templated, I don't ever like to send the same template to a client twice. So we have our first time proposal when someone's worked with us the first time. But if they've worked with us a second time, I don't want them to get that proposal and go, oh, 
that, f- that first proposal that they sent us was pretty templated. I see they've used a lot of similar sections. So we actually, the second time, have a, have a shorter version. And then the third time, it's shorter still because I always want everyone to get the sense that everything has been customized for them. Um, but we have our long proposals. We have our short proposals. We have, as I mentioned, statements of work. So if someone doesn't need a full proposal, but they just need a clarifying document that says this is everything we've talked about, uh, all the way down to just simply we, we've hit the point where they've agreed to move forward with us and we send them a service agreement. And it's like, here's, here's, our, here's our legal contract. Here's our service agreement with, with all the stuff stipulated in there. We didn't even do a proposal. Um, so so I, I would suggest that if you find through your process, big long answer to say, if you find through your process you're, you're, you're losing people at a given step, whether that's the first call or the first meeting or an email follow-up or a presentation of creative or the proposal, if you're losing people at a given step, you need to investigate that step. Uh, and whether you're giving the client enough time to get comfortable with you, are you or is it just a matter of pricing or whatever it may be, You need to work at eliminating or softening that step and then continuing to add stuff, keeping in mind that you don't want people to run over you and and take advantage of your time. You need to be very direct and clear with people. But that's the way we look at the process. Well, I had a mentor of mine, too, and he's pretty prominent in the industry. And he actually said the other day he was ranting about these showreels. And he said these showreels are not what the customer or the consumer or the serious business owner or marketing professional is looking for most of the time, because it makes us feel good as creatives. It was more specific, and I know that Fanta uses that excellent, one of the excellent videos that you guys have on your website, which really explains your approach, and you answer a lot of questions up front. My question is, is what do you think are some of the non-negotiables when you're dealing with a company that's like a video production company like mine, which is video, graphics, photography, and that's pretty much our, our wheelhouse. We love that, and we do that really well. But when you're approaching a company or proposal, what are the things that are sort of the non-negotiables that you're going to present to them on the front end that they have to know about and that they have to see to add value to what even get to even get where you need to go in a conversation? Yeah. So, um, you know what I'm I'm I don't know if I'm crazy as crazy as I think I am, but I'm pretty crazy about really working hard to try and manage the experience through the sales process. And so probably about four years ago, we stopped showing examples of work in our meetings. We don't, we don't show any examples of work. Um, it's on our website. If they, if, they, you know, if they don't, everything that we do is so customized for our client that um, now I was in a meeting this morning where someone specifically asked for some examples. So I pulled a few um, and I showed 45 seconds of like four or five different things while, while they were playing. But we definitely don't use a reel. Um, even though we have one on YouTube, I don't think it's anywhere on our website. It might, might be on a sub page. Um, that opening video that's on our landing page when you land there, we used that once uh, last year because, again, someone was trying to sell us internally up to the CEO of the company. And so the head of marketing wanted us to bring something where in a 60 seconds it would basically just add credibility because the guy, the CEO, was never going to go to our website. But otherwise, we don't show examples, we don't show a reel. We don't really make an effort to try and make sure that we tell the client anything other than leave them with the impression we want to leave them with. So, like, we don't go out of our way to try and say, you know, here are the things you need to understand about video production. Because what I've learned over the years is you can never, you can never assume that, that people haven't already done this before with other agencies and they haven't done it with really good agencies. So you don't want to come in there trying to teach them something that they already know. Um, equally, they could say, oh, I've worked with lots of video companies before, and you, and you might take for granted that they have done, um, that they have a lot of experience, but they may have worked with terrible agencies and may, in fact, turn out to have no experience, really. So we just, I, just try not to, I just try to work on leaving the lasting impression and always pushing towards the next step. Um, so, you know, you might do a meet and greet and you're going to push for maybe a bit more of a needs analysis or a brief meeting. You do the brief meeting. You might push for further clarifying questions or presentation of creative. And then you move from that to locking down and getting them to agree. Yeah, you know, we definitely have budget. We have need. We have timelines. We have, we have everything we need. And then you put that into a document of some sort based off of what they'd like to see. And then you present that and then you follow up. Um, but you know, I, I think, I think whatever you need to do to leave, leave the lasting impression you need to leave. Um, and so that comes into who you are, you know, you may decide that 
you are a, a one page type of person, you know, you might be all about simplicity. And you might you might say, listen, I'm not going to be one of these agencies that does a, do- a song and dance or you know the pony show. <laughs> what would you call that, Leah? The, the dog and pony show. The dog and pony show. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, you might not be that person, or you might be the person to say, listen, I'm not the person to put this in writing. I'm only going to come to you and present a PowerPoint presentation. It's like it's like whatever. It, it's it's um, it's a show, right? It's an experience. Buying off someone is an experience, and when you decide what you're going to buy, no matter what you're buying. It's based off the experience you're given, and and whether you're buying a car or you're buying a house or you're buying anything, it's a, it's a very very emotional thing, and and so we want to customize what we do to make sure that whatever we're delivering leaves them that emotional impact, like co- like like uh, s- spelling mistakes and typos and copywriting. Um, I am terrible at spelling. I'm terrible at spelling, and I make mistakes all the time, and I try not to. But I'm really hard on everyone here because I go, okay, one of our services we offer is script writing. What kind of impression does it leave with a prospect or client when we tell them we're going to charge them for script writing, but we're not, you know, eloquent or poetic or, you know, providing proper context or even proper grammar or even proper spelling in our communications? So to me, it's like I want to leave the impression that that it makes sense to work with us because we're a professional organization. That's not just in talk. That's also how we write and what we write. But then it, as you continue that forward, it's like that also comes into um, branding and design. You know, like we have a letterhead that I make everyone on the company put everything in that, that we spent a few hours like, like I'm not talking about a corporate letterhead, like, you know, here's a part of a branding exercise. I mean, like, oh. like, like I'm looking right now at a podcast brief that Leah gave me for episode 25. Our podcast brief, which is on our letterhead, has a very specific client code, episode number, the guest, the version, the day it was updated and not updated. And every document that we share with clients has to follow that creative because I want to leave a seamless um, uh, experience to show that even in the little details of what we're sending you, we're a professional company. So carry that forward to your proposal. It's like your proposal is going to be whatever experience you want to leave with them. On our side, I treat it more like um, a magazine spread. You know, I want it to feel our, our proposals are very detailed and very long and highly customized. But, you know, they're also laid out in, in, in a graphic software. They're not t- they're, they're typed up in Word, but then they're copied over and customized and laid out page by page. Um, to make sure that when someone gets it, it feels like they're almost getting like a, a digital brochure or a really high end PDF or something like that, or a magazine article. Like that's that's the impression I want to leave with people is like, yeah, we're not only legit strategically, we don't only produce great video, we don't only you know take the time and we're competitively priced. But as you can see from what we're delivering to you, it, even just reading our proposal is an experience in itself. That's what I want to try and give. And people might think it's pretentious or whatever, but that that's the standard I want to set. Can I just say, so you help people buy sales tools that are videos, but do it during your sales. You do not use videos. No, yeah. no, because the video would hurt us more than anything no, else. No, I understand. I totally understand. Right. So, so here's the thing. When you close your eyes and I walk through verbally, when I walk you through, okay. you know, oh, you know, opening scene, the sun is rising. And as the sun rises, we see our hero step into frame and they turn on the lights and they sit at their chair. It's early morning. They get a cup of coffee. We, we dolly through. We see this. We see that. Whatever you see in your mind is perfect. Mm-hmm. It's perfect. As soon as I go to show you an example, you're like, oh, uh, the coloring. Well, that was for that brand. Oh, the graphics are weird. Was, are we going to do floating cam or steady cam or is it dollies? And, and do we have budget? For, and it just becomes like it becomes grounded in reality rather than this perfect vision that's in your head. What about when you haven't done something before? And oh, there's lots of stuff we haven't done. You have not done before. So <laughs> I think that Mar- Mark, I think your strategy works perfect for that because you don't even have a video to show them. Then, no. Right? So you're and so just- and the, and and you can't you can't show them because all you can do is say, listen, we've been doing this for for you know, you, never mind when you started your company. You've been doing this for however many years you've been doing it in the profession. So Matt, like you know, if even if you started company last year, but you have five years experience, I've been doing this for five years. Whatever it is. Right, we started our company nine years ago, but I still use a decade all the time because I was doing it for years before that. So I say, you know, for a decade now. But, but you know, go go to our, go to our website. You'll get a sense of what we're about. If you don't have a portfolio, you can say that, or go shoot stuff, shoot anything. 
right? You you have a website that Matt that you know, Mint Studios has a website that leaves an impression. You, if I remember correctly, there's lots of aerial shots. Um, you know, it's it's very cinematic. You you your website has all the behind the scenes photos, right? Of like the shorts you you've done and things like that. Right. Yeah, I love it. I, I love it. I, I send it to my team. I was like, why, why aren't we doing this on set? Right. So, so you have the cred, like you have the credibility, the technical credibility. You just don't over talk and don't overplay it. Right. It's, it's the, well, if you, you know, and you can challenge clients, you say, listen, you know, I've been, I've been doing this for five years. Go look at our, go, go check out our website. I'll give you a few uh, testimonials from other clients we worked with. But the truth is everything we do is custom. So if you're asking me to go out and somehow magically find, um, something that has your exact length with your exact creative, with your exact target audience or your exact technical feel or whatever it may be, I will not be able to find it because what we're doing for you is completely unique. So what about, Mark, when clients don't <laughs> right? uh, don't understand, like, uh, I guess these would be pretty new clients, but when you're a startup, like, Matt, you probably have people that don't have video or don't have much video yet. Right. right are getting video from you. Right. So what about yeah. when a client, when you're like, okay, we're going to do uh, like a... Uh, T- a client testimonial and they're like i don't know what that is and you're like we're gonna cut to b-roll shots happens. they're like i that don't know what happens. that is people know what everything is yeah so you don't use the word cutaways like we used to use the word cutaways a lot and we use it internally we i, I say visuals now so we re- i rewrite a lot of proposals okay. and just say visuals additional visuals um we try to explain certain things you know uh everybody knows what it is because we still use jumping off points and so there's, there's, here's, a little, here's a little pro tip. Here's a little trick. Um, we don't show them specific examples of our work to say, hey, look at how we know what we're talking about because we come in assuming they know what we're talking about. We know what we're talking about. I don't need to prove to you that we do. Go look at my website. I have 190 examples of our work. We've been operating for 10 years. We have nine full-time staff. Look at our client list. You think we don't know what we're talking about? We know what we're talking about. Relax. Okay, but how do you have that confidence but, when you're a startup? Mark? Reel that back 10 years. Yeah, right. like how do you have that right. confidence? Which you is can't where I things. said, don't try to be me. Right. Start right. with one, turn one into two, turn two into four, four into eight. Are you talking eight. about your kids now? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Multiply like rabbits. No. No, you got to start. You got to start with your early wins. Right. Right? Okay. So like I said, we started with internal communications. The first project I did with this bank it was for um, a nonprofit, and I think I charged thirty eight hundred dollars, and it was the biggest project I ever did. And I think it was like two or three years later, maybe two or three years later. Yeah, I I worked for like four months to close a seventy two hundred dollar promo that had that had uh, three days of production with talent, with makeup, with um, uh, with factory shots. I had to replace all the factory workers because they were concerned with ethnic backgrounds. And we, and we brought in, oh man, it was this huge production for 7,200. I don't, we didn't make any money on it, but, but it, it just, it just takes time to build yourself up. So just keep working at it and give yourself time and turn and, and just keep working forward. And every time that you're showing a client something, you can say, you know, you can move up your pricing, you know, time by time, you can ask for additional resources, you can figure out ways to package things differently. You may not come in with the confidence, but at the end of the day, you still have to have confidence in what you're delivering to the client, right? And so that confidence, it's easy for me to say should come to you. But even when I go into, you know, if, if, I, if I left this business and I decided, you know, my, back, my backup in my mind is I'm going to start a ground maintenance company and cut grass and snow, and snow plow for a living, why wouldn't <laughs> I be able to sell that? Okay. Why, right? It, does, does, it take, does it take a smarter person to do that? Am I in a business that no. requires smarter people than ground maintenance? No, it's, it's video, right? Like, like it's, you know, like I was, was I telling you about when I got it? So we, we moved into a house with a pool. And my wife wanted me to pay a company to open the pool. And I was like, if oh, a yeah. pool boy can figure out how to open a pool and balance chemicals, I can figure it out. And it took me a lot of time to but research But it's about it. but time, though. I always want... Okay. I but want this is his business. So why doesn't he have confidence? Matt, you have confidence, right? Yes, I it? do. <laughs> <laughs> I have okay. lots of confidence. But so. I did cut you off and you were going to explain um, you do use videos in right. your proposal process, but they're jumping yes. off points, Jumping right? off points. Yeah. We got, I, I've used that term for a long time now. I think I got it, well, I think I heard um, someone in like, um, 
interior design company use it. I right? always picture someone diving off a really high diving board when you say it. So we why. call them JOPs in- internally, but yeah. basically a jumping off point is an inspiration point, right? It's like a mood board. So they used to do in interior designs, right? They do these mood boards with swatches and photos and they would pull magazine articles. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've heard people do brand exercises where they're like, are you, you know, the cowboy or James Bond? And you put pictures up, right? It's all, it's all the same thing. It's just an inspiration point. So we leverage jumping off points where... And it usually happens post sale, to be honest now. Usually, like we've already closed the deal by the time mm-hmm. we've done it. But sometimes, if we need to kick in to show them what, where we're going, right? You asked, well, what if they don't understand testimonials and we need to show them what we're talking about? And, and I will use it sometimes in pitches and stuff. Uh, we'll pull anything, we'll pull anything. Not your work, no. Either, right? Well, like, I mean, I mean, sometimes, but sometimes, sometimes it's not, our work, right? but most of the time it's actually not our work. Yeah. Because it might be like, hey, this Icelandic music video that we found that has nothing to do with your business. Do you see how in these 10 seconds they do this? That We take that, add this, fairy dust, sprinkle in a little bit of that, and you got yourself magic kind of thing. Have you ever sold somebody else's work and actually lost the account and they went to somebody else? No, because we're not we're not selling their work, right? Like like we're using it as as a conversation point because we need to take that and in most cases in in most cases clients say I like this and I like that. I like everything you showed me, so how can we work to combine it or things like that? And it and it is it is just a jumping off point. And for the most part, it's content that is not um it's not related in industry. Like, you know, if we have an automotive manufacturer, we're not going to go out and find an automotive manufacturer video and from even especially from our market be- because most of the stuff of the people we're working with to be honest we think is junk you know like there's no comparable we can't go um, hey you're a pharmaceutical company in you know in New York let's say right and you're you're working with a pharmaceutical company in New York here are six other pharmaceutical companies all in New York who had stuff produced by companies in New York and we want to pull something and, oh, by the way, the agency happens to be free and work with the same amount of budgets and this and that. If anything, we're pulling like we're, – we're saying like, hey, um, Ford Europe put out an, uh, an international campaign for a million dollars and we love it and we want to try and roll it out to um, a granola bar manufacturer who has $50,000, right? Like it's just, it's just something that inspires us to work into – or, or to be used as an element that we can get the conversation going with the client in a tangible way and say, hey, here you go. This is the conversation. The, you know, this is what we want to start with, but we still need to customize it for you, right? Your client, your target audience, your market, your brand, your feeling. So how do you ask for more budget once you've already got a signature, once you're already moving in, and then you have this aha moment internally and – Things have changed. Uh, Timelines are already set. How do you ask for more money? Um, do you would would you ask for more money? You've made a commitment to your client. Their expectations are set. You have timelines. You have budget. You have it signed. I would say I would say it really depends on whether you can on you can carefully onboard them with your new vision or not. Because if you can get them, you know, if you can say, listen, hey, you know, we, we have this original thing. And uh, listen, I know I know we've signed on it. I know that I know that we're, we're going to move forward on it. It's great. It's great. But I was thinking, this is not a bait and switch in any means. What, what you want is perfect. But I was thinking that there's this extra opportunity that I wanted to explore with you. And I will warn you up front that it is going to cost another, you know, 30% or X number of dollars. And if budgets are budgets, if budgets are tight, I totally understand. But... I at least want to bring it to you. I at least want to get you, you know, give you the opportunity to turn it down or, or, or maybe you want to. I don't know. It's up to you. But if you went like super soft like that and, and re-pitched them and got them on board with it, then, then and it's up to them, totally up to them, and you're not in any way downplaying your original thing so it doesn't feel like somehow you're having scope creep or bait and switch later, that's fine. We really try not to do that. Like, like we work so hard with our clients and spend so much time up front that if they want to make changes, they can. If we spot an opportunity, we may bring it to them. But more often than not, we just pay for it ourselves. If it's really such an important thing and it's key to the project and we feel like we missed it, like we should have thought of it earlier, then, um, you know, and if it's not going to break our backs, then we will actually 
cover the costs ourselves and then let the client know that we're doing that, that that we feel that there was an opportunity to do something. We're committed to them. We believe in them. We're using this as an example piece. Um, we're not going to just somehow move up pricing later and earn it back or whatever. We're doing this because we believe in them and the project, and we're paying for this out of pocket. And I would say nine out of ten projects have some element to them that we are, that I, <laughs> that me, I own the business, that I am in fact paying for. Uh, myself and we we work really hard to try and carefully share that with the clients so they don't somehow feel guilty about it later. But um, you know, in in April or August, we did this big project with a client that we pitched, and it had a fixed price from the very beginning. We pitched them some ideas based on this fixed price. We went from two to three days of production. We went from like three talent to six talent. We we covered all those costs herself. And when I had lunch with the client later sh- afterwards, I was kind of mentioning to her how we over delivered, and she said, "Well, you charged us back for that, right? Like you build it back. It was an overage." And I said, "No, it's not an overage because we wanted to do what was right for the project. So I paid for it myself, right? And um, yeah, I think I think you got to be careful, Matt. I have two yeah. things to say yeah. about that. Wow. First, okay, when, do you remember when we had Patrick Moreau on the podcast from Still Motion? Yeah. Remember what he was talking about? Uh, like this is an extreme circumstance, but he was saying that sometimes with his brides and grooms, uh, like because he was so focused on story, because his, uh, his projects are so artistic, that he would tell them, like I could tell the story in a totally different way for like another like $100,000. Like his projects were crazy, right? Mm-hmm. And, they, and, and tell them like th- this is how passionate I am about my new idea. We don't have to do it, but this is like what it would cost. Careful, right? Because you don't want them to be put in a position. Think about yourself. I'm the client. I always, yeah. think, I always think what's the client perception, right? I'm really excited about the idea you originally gave me. I signed. I've committed to it. I've maybe even, depending on the company, I've already got my boss to commit to it. Mm-hmm. And now you're coming to me with something even better. Yeah, and I guess he had really intimate relationships with those yeah. couples. Like he would, they were like out to dinner. But you don't want to. But but let's say that they get really excited about your new idea, but they can't move ahead with it. They're going right. to feel shortchanged. Right. They're going to feel like there was something better out there that they couldn't have, rather than leave the the project. That's totally feeling true. like they got what they needed and wanted and feel great about it, and then yeah. you s- you save that in your back pocket for the after the meeting's done. You go, you go, you know what? As we produce this, let's roll this out. Let's see what happens. But I already have some ideas for phase two. Either a okay. totally different video or a tweak. Let's tweak the yeah. video six months later or a year later as a phased approach because you're a partner and you're ongoing with them. If you if you have a relationship where you there's no risk of them feeling like they're somehow settling, upsell, man. Go for it. But I just, I'm you know, and maybe I leave a lot of money on the table. But I really, I, I just always think, you know, as we're doing each step with the client, back to client experience, we want to give great experiences. How can we make sure that they're not somehow feeling like they're being shortchanged or settling? Yeah. Okay. My second part was, um, what about if it's the client's fault, basically? Oh, like then, a, then it's an overage. If you need more money. It's an overage. It's an overage. That's, that's not even, you, there's no emotion tied to that. It's like, hey, um, you know, we were under the impression we were working two days. It's three days. Someone got sick. Someone's not there. Oh, you want to add sound or makeup? Oh, you want to, Yeah. Um, hey, we, you know, we went... <laughs> How crazy could this happen? Hey, we went and shot a commercial in Dominican and and it was raining all the time. So we now have to digitally replace the sky and all these shots or, hey, you yeah. know, we were told the beaches would be raked clean, but they're not. So now we have to digitally erase seaweed or German tourists or whatever it is. That's just, that's just, <laughs> a, that's an overage. And, you know, they can just, you know, it costs what it costs. Things cost what they cost to do them, right? Right. So then that's my perception. When you go back to the client, you're just unemotional. This is what it is. Yeah, you, you, but you have to explain the benefit, right? Like, hey, yeah. I mean, if you don't want us to replace the sky, we could do it, but the whole project is hinging on blue it skies. It looking beautiful, yeah, looking exactly. Looking gorgeous. Right. I mean, like, we have, we have no control over the weather. No. Well, right. and you put that in your terms of service, don't you, or whatever the whatever you use in your contract, uh, I'm assuming? Maybe. So. I think it's there. Yeah. <laughs> Our, like, yeah, but I mean, you, like, listen, we're in Canada, so contracts are meaningless up here <laughs> nobody <laughs> is litigious nobody will sue anyone on anything ever um you know <laughs> like it's just it's just yeah i can't i i think the last time where i had to go back and double tr- track check the exact wording of a contract was because a client was really late in paying us and i had to chase them for like three or four months to pay us but they still paid us so maybe you guys in the states would go back to your contract to check wording but but we would just go back to them and say Hey, you know, here, here's, here's the overage, right? And it's, and it's provoked by something that they're doing. If it's, if it's us, then we cover the cost and we never tell them about it. 
you know, we add extra editing all the time. Mm -hmm. We had extra time. Every agency does. Every agency ends up spending more time on things than they think they're going to or more resources. And that's just the cost of doing business. How long have you been doing this? The persona of really stepping up and and starting to project that voice of authority where you you're 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 feeding the industry versus trying to go get sales and show work. Well, I mean, I spent a lot of my <laughs> I spent a lot of my time on sales, uh, but in terms of the podcast and what we've been doing, I mean, there was a really a few things that kicked it off. Um, probably about two and a half years ago, was it Leah? It was March, so maybe three years ago. Now we mm-hmm. got connected with Adobe, and. Yeah, was maybe it two, two years ago. I think it was two, you were pregnant. I was still. pregnant. Yeah, so two years ago we got connected with Adobe and we did. Um, they asked us to do um, a webinar, and then I've been friends with Evan Carmichael, which is I think the the, the hangout you referenced um, for a long time. But we did something there, and and it was just slowly more and more people were kind of finding us and asking us questions. I was having coffees with people in the Toronto area and whatnot, and then and then last. Um, uh, maybe a year ago, or a little over a year ago, I decided to do a podcast, but it mm-hmm. took us four or five months to start up, really working through everything and figuring it out. So, and now um, I was gone. Yeah, you were gone. So it's really been about a year that we've been really fully committed to just spending a lot of time and money and effort um, on oh, sharing information with people, like just just you know working. I mean, we for years we've quote unquote been thought leaders, but that's a bit of a bullshit thing where it's like you know thought leadership was this big thing you could sell for years and years and years, but you actually got to produce the content. You got to step up and be willing to spend the time and the money and share. A year and a half ago, though, you hired someone to do blogging, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is like that's a big part of it. Doing like researching topics in our industry yeah. and. You well, and how has that done? What has that done for you? The last, you know, you've been doing since I guess somewhere, I guess at the beginning of summer, that you guys started doing your podcast. Um, what's changed? Anything? Have you noticed any kind of are people calling you now all the time for business, or is it? <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing at. <laughs> I'm laughing because uh, listen, at the end of the day, our, I mean, our best our best lead sources is repeat business, referral business. Um, Google pay per click and um, partnerships, strategic partnerships. So, like us working with uh, like marketing associations and, as sponsors, and then getting attraction, and then networking, and then and then meeting, and then getting referred to people or meeting people. Like way down the list is is these additional marketing activities. But with that said, the intangible is you know we do we did a big project two years ago and we you know when I had this person on you know before Leah who was helping me with stuff we started a monthly newsletter we profiled the work in the monthly newsletter and then someone who we'd worked with six years ago and hadn't spoken to a few years saw it and went wow that's awesome and then brought me in for work and then that project kicked up a new relationship and I think we we're doing like four or five projects with them this year so I can attribute that just to the newsletter um, but that's not the podcast you know we did a Christmas video that Leah put out and mm-hmm. we again we emailed it out. A lot of our leads tend to come specifically from, um, like that are directly attributed tend to come from email marketing is still great because it's just retouching with old people that you've been in touch with in the past and have relationships in the past. But um, we got called back in on a client who saw our Christmas video and went, "You need to do whatever you it is whatever it is you guys did in that Christmas video. We want you to do it for our brand." Um, so so to answer your question. This is a lot of effort, <laughs> and there's no direct correlation to sales at this time. It's 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 really like, it's really a long play to try and prove an ROI from a podcast or a YouTube. It's account. good for morale, in, yeah. uh, in office morale. We, well, yeah, we love doesn't it. it. Doesn't it help you speak from a voice of authority? That you're, it gives you more confidence. And so the, I mean, I don't know if there's tangible. I mean, does it help you as a company close deals with a little bit more efficiency because you're. Constantly regurgitating the vision and the, the approach, or um, I, I try not to tie too much of, of of Fanta into the podcast if I can. Leah is now <laughs> giving me a face. I really do because it's yeah. like because yeah. I mean, if you guys if you guys all spent a day with me or whatever at the office or a week with me, um, I really try to I really try to make the podcast about getting the most interesting people to give the most value for our listeners. And, and I learn f- in turn as you guys are learning or, you know, or it's, it's a chance for me to then say, Hey, I was thinking about this thing and I wish someone told it to me 10 years ago or, or five years ago. And then I want to share it with everyone. Um, we don't really do it 
like for me to rehearse my speeches or whatnot because I don't, you know, even the stuff we got into today, which is probably more telling than we normally would on a podcast, I wouldn't really share, I mean, I wouldn't really share this stuff mostly through our social media stuff because I think it's too, um, um, I think I'm, I'm worried that people are going to take what I say verbatim and try to implement it themselves and then go, oh, it doesn't work. Right. When, when really so much of, of what I've learned over the last decade about owning a business or marketing is is you have to uber you have to embrace who you are and then and then project that 150 percent or whatever most people aren't comfortable embracing who they truly are they try to emulate emulate others and then the people who are comfortable embracing who they are don't really push it out and if they do push it out it's half-hearted they don't go all the way So maybe that's something that this podcast has helped me with is like, it's like, listen, I know who I am. I know the value that I add. I want to push it out, but maybe the podcast or what we're doing on YouTube or even what we're doing in the blogs is us trying to push it out all the way, but we still got, we still got a way to go. I mean, you know, we only have so much time and so much budget to do stuff. There's, there's tons of stuff I'd love to be able to, to do that we just don't have time to do, but, but it's always about just pushing out who we are all like all the way but one of the biggest things that I um, heard you say on the front end that kind of pushed me in one direction on the on the was when you were on that podcast you talked about getting a sales rep you know you, you move right into getting somebody that could do sales for you because you weren't innately um, I guess a, a salesperson I guess I don't know can you kind of talk about why you did that and did it work and what would you sell somebody that's in um, a one to two year startup scenario Yeah. So, I mean, certainly if anyone wants to check out episode two of the Not So Corporate podcast, I think we recorded back in May. Uh, We had Dan on and we talked about bringing on a sales rep um, early on. But uh, to circle around on your question, you know, you say I brought on a sales rep right away. I think I was like four years into the business when I, maybe three and a half when I brought Dan on. Um, And I I really do cover it off a lot in episode two, but it's... um, I do not know if I recommend. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I'm. I'm torn, because it's such a. It's such a money commitment, and it's. It's very, very tempting. And I think where we landed on on that episode was like, if you're just looking for a sales rep, someone who wants you to generate leads, hand them the leads, and they're just going to turn over leads, or a hunter, someone who's just going to work the leads and close the deals and and then move on. It's. It's a bit risky and and expensive and a bit of a challenge because because the the fail rate I think is fairly high. Um, we're in a pretty technical business. We're in a marketing business, but it's not, you know, it's not only the marketing savvy, but it's also understanding consultative sales or, you know, you're not, you're not just quoting and you have to also be an account manager to a certain degree. And you also have to have a technical knowledge to be able to understand production. And there's just a lot to it. And so I, I think it takes a unique person to be able to operate in that space. But I think where we landed on it is if you, if you have more of a partner, if you have more of someone who they may be in a sales role, they may not even be a, a legal partner, but if someone who operates or thinks more like a partner who's going to help you with your sales who's going to help you with your marketing with your positioning with your account management who's going to treat treat your business like their business and someone who's going to be able to come in and challenge you and just just help you in all ways grow and and become maybe stronger or better or or more mature as a business or just up your game or whatever it may be all those extra tangibles um then then it may be something to explore or be worth it but but if it's if it's a salesperson coming in as a salesperson I don't know. They're a bit egotistical usually, and you know, if if you just got someone coming in thinking they're hot shit, then it's a really expensive way to blow money. Well, I have to concur because we actually <laughs> did that, <laughs> and uh, I mean, it was my brother, and he's an awesome, you know, he's an awesome guy. Uh, but with all due respect, I, your you brother know. is hot shit, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and he. Uh, I tell you what, he. You know, he worked as hard as he could, and he and I, you know, we grew up, but we all, but he's not, well, number one, he's an incredible salesman. Number one on that side of it when he started working with us is that it just kind of came down to account managing and not having the experience to, you know, when it came to video production and and what were the priorities and how to, you know, just some technical things that, you know, how you can you speak to it. But then um, second half of it just kind of came down to, what are we, how are we, how are we onboarding people to the company when, you know, you, all it is is really more like lead generating. And that's, you know, that to me is very technical, getting a lead generated. Um, on the personal side of it, yeah, it, you're right. 
what makes it expensive is if there's not this long-term commitment to actually growing media and marketing. And uh, if it's not in your expertise level, then I don't think it's going to be successful. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's important to note, and you hit it, it's important to note the difference between account managing and business development, right? Business development is generating leads, generating sales, getting sales started, but it's very, very, very different than account managing, right? Account managing has aspects of sales and business development has as, as, aspects of account managing, but they are not the same thing. And so if, if you know clearly what you want, then that's fine. But, um, you know, the easiest thing to do would probably to build, build a machine to clone yourself. It'd probably be easier than finding a salesperson who's going to give you everything you want. Yeah, I agree. As a business owner, that's one of the things that, you know, I know it, I lead it, I develop it. If I can't do my on the front end of it, if I can't do my own sales and if I can't get out there and generate and have at least uh, have at least my own wheelhouse in that area, then uh, there's no way that I don't think it's going to happen or it's going to be expensive, like you're saying. Yeah, I mean, sale, listen, sales is the sales, every business, every business, every industry, sales is, is a challenge. I mean, it's work. And um, either you're going to do it or someone else in your company is going to do it. But, but I always find it's, it's actually... Um, to the organization, it's beneficial to just ensure that that in some way the founder or the owner or the creative director or whoever it is, whoever's whoever's heading up the organization is some way involved in it. They don't have to do it all, right? Like, you know, again, Dan's been here six and a half years with me. You don't have to do it all, but but it's, it is helpful um, and, and, and important that, that whoever's leading the organization is still involved um, in it in my mind. But It really is turning into more of me interviewing you. <laughs> and I think that that... That works. I mean, it, it, uh, yeah, your, your confidence, speaking with the voice of authority, the fact that you don't go in and you don't show video, it's the, inver it's the inverse to what a lot of guys would think, especially new guys starting up, to build on your strengths, you know, to stick in your, stay in your wheelhouse, that kind of mentality. But well, well, everything listen, kind listen. of exudes with that confidence and that authority that you're talking about. It's taking time. It takes time. I remember I met with someone. I got a great meeting with someone. Through networking, I was doing this cold calling soft I, thing. I think it's a personality trait, though. Sorry to interrupt you, though, Mark. I do think it's part of your personality. No, no, but I was going to well. say, I was going to say, I met with this guy and I met with the CEO of this huge development company who built condos, like a $400 million company. I got a meeting with the guy through a board of trade, soft selling. Anyway, I meet with the guy and he's like, you know what? I like your kid. Like he's in his 60s and he's just like, this is the softest sell I've ever heard. I like, I think it was a year in business, two years in business. I like your kid. I'm going to set you up a meeting with my marketing manager. Great, cool. So I get, I walk in, I come all the way back downtown, walk into this meeting with the marketing manager, and he literally, he's like, "Listen, um, I've I've looked at your stuff, I looked at your website, I don't see any need to ever work with a company like yours. I don't know why this meeting was set up, but I'm taking it out of respect for the owner of the business. Um, so, what would you like to say now?" <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, uh, um, and so when like Matt, like I look at your website, you're way better off than I was. If I showed you guys what I was doing in 2007, it was, it was horrific. It was, it's. I would like a screenshot of that. Uh, I, feel I like might be able to find it on the servers. <laughs> it was, it was terrible. It was terrible. It probably took me three or four years just to figure out my stuff because back then there was no, like, you know, there was no, um, WordPress packages. There was yeah. no. There was no nothing. I had to have a friend help me build an HTML site, and there was no. There, everything was through Flash. We didn't Code have a streaming server, so it was just. It was terrible. But so I mean, you, you gotta you gotta start and you gotta get there. But the questions I'd have for you, you know, I appreciate you asking me questions. The questions I have for you is, listen, if I'm if I'm a listener and I'm one year behind you, so you're six months into your business or whatever you're into your business, if I'm one year behind you, if I'm thinking about launching in six months, what's your advice just coming through this? Well, you've got to figure out, number one, what are your strengths, period, and really build on the strengths of that type of thing. And then if that's a strength, I always tell people, if you're getting paid for it and people uh, – People have you've either you, you're either getting paid for it or people have have bought your work before. Then you're a professional. Take what you've learned, take your strength, and really build on it from that point, and build it out as far as you can go with it. Because if people don't look at you as an authority in the market, then it then you're selling. People don't want to people don't want to be sold. They want to buy, and you've got to get people to the point where they just you know you relax them the fact that you're an authority in the market, and you've got to speak from a voice of authority. And what else? <laughs> I feel, I feel, that's, a, that's a good one. 
That's a good well, one. But what I else? tell them to keep it simple. You know, one of the mistakes that we made first off is kind of getting sucked into a lot of different things that were not. We, I think we could do it, but it keeps us off track when it came to you know social media, marketing, corporate messaging, um, you know, even website building and things that were really not in our video world, graphic design, photography world. And we allowed the clients to sort of pull us out when wisdom now looking back over several months and almost a year is just to simply incorporate a third party but be on the hunt on the front end that hey you, I, can go to, I can go talk to another marketing person that's maybe got a startup just like I do but they're marketing and I say look if I've got marketing questions and clients and people that want to get into uh, corporate messaging dealing with websites SEO and all those types of things can I bring them to you we work at a deal on the front end and that's one of the first things I should have done and I look back on it now, and a lot of our presentations were talking about things that are not even really in our wheelhouse to do. Um, and I, I could have done a, uh, probably changed my presentations or changed the proposals. I'm a relational kind of guy, and that really sabotaged several months for us uh, because it, I wasn't speaking uh, in something that was, that number one, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But number two, I was having to kind of speak for people that could have just spoken for themselves. That's something that I think comes with time, but I, I remember when I started out, and, and maybe you're still there, where you feel like you you feel like you need to know the answer, otherwise you'll instantly lose credibility with the client. And we spend so much time telling clients we just don't know, um, or thinking things through in front of the client. I mean, you know, if a client can ask a really tough question, I have no issue sitting there for a minute or two, just thinking about it. There's silence in the room. You're like you're in the middle of a meeting. There's five people there or whatever. I need a minute to think about it, or I need to say, you know what, that's a tough one. Um, I'm going to think about that and come back to you, or I've never gotten that question before, or that's, you know, that's a real tough one. Let's talk that out, or whatever it is, or I, or just simply, I, 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 I don't know. I don't have that. I, there's no way for me to answer that for you right now. So let's, I'll note it down, and we'll come, we'll work through the process and try to work towards it. There's nothing wrong with saying, you know, you don't know or it's it's not your expertise or whatever it may be because it always just points back to what your expertise it's always the opportunity to say I you know I can't speak to that I apologize what I can't speak to is blah 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 what you're really really good at and you can always just swing it back in um, I don't know if you're facing that but when I think back I spent so much time trying to be the person that I think that I thought I should have been rather than just be me right well and I could say you know I'm, <laughs> the funny thing is a lot of business owners or a lot of the startups that that are doing production they're young I've been doing this for 25 years. I've been in broadcast, I've been in film, I've been private, I've been corporate, and uh, I've been doing it a long, long time. And I'm a producer, and I solve problems. I commit to solving and bringing uh, solutions to these problems. And yet, when we started, we began the startup, you know, something kind of, if you allow it, it can take over, which is um, you thinking that you have to be all things to all men because. Now people have, you know, either whether it's a small business, medium-sized business, large company, um, you can allow yourself to be taken off track when if you just, you know, we, in Texas we say stick with the girl that brung you, you know, then if you, st if you stay there and you really focus all of your efforts in that area, then, and you speak from a voice of authority in that area, then it really does matter to everybody that everything you're trying to accomplish and everything that everyone around you um, that you're trying to add confidence to them as well because now that we've gotten a little bit bigger I've got people that are relying on me we've got all these different things and if I if I deviate and if I pull everybody off course and we're talking 40 hours about websites when really we should be you know staying in our lane um, you know that's what that's what causes a lot of jeopardy I, I like I like your saying. We have you know up here in Canada, we have a bit more of a gender neutral uh, saying, which I think is "dance with the one that brought you." But um, <laughs> but but I, I definitely I definitely like your um, male focused saying. That works too. Yeah, yeah. I guess well, down in Texas, men are men, right? Every day, <laughs> and I live you know I'm in Longhorn Country down here, University of Texas. It is what it is at that point. I like it. Yeah. yeah. So that was our conversation with Matt Garner. As you can tell, I am in love with the guy. Oh my I think goodness, he's there's awesome. Roland. 
<laughs> <laughs> wow, Roland made it for the very end. Hey, he's Ro- out a window right now, so you guys yeah. can't hear him, but he's starting a car and driving away. <laughs> a great play by play. Anyways, I was I was in the process of saying Matt Garner joined us and and I wanted to thank Matt. If if you'd like to find out more about Mint Studios, check them out. The website is madebymint.com. Uh, that's mint, M-I-N-T, like, mm, that's fresh and minty. Uh, so check them out. Check out what Matt Gardner's doing uh, and send them some love if you can. Yeah. Anyway, so with that, we're going to wrap up the podcast. Leah, thanks so much for joining us and contributing so much to this podcast this I, week. I know. It was awesome. I and know. Roland, who um, we just saw in the parking lot at the <laughs> yeah. very end. Uh, Aloha. Aloha. Hello and goodbye. Roland. <laughs> Listen, guys, Roland likes you. He does. He really actually gets upset when he's not on the podcast. So I just want y'all to know that. Uh, I'm yeah, saying if y'all he sees us in there, he'll now, go. But, uh, anyway, thanks so much for listening. And uh, oh, I can't wait till next week's episode. It's a very special episode, but we'll have to tell you about it next week. Anyway, thanks so much for listening. Oh, hi. Creepy.